1933, Raymond Chandler sold his first professional story, Blackmailers Don't Lie, to Black Mask. It wasn't until 1939 that he published his first Philip Marlowe novel, The Big Sleep. By 1942, Hollywood came calling. Chandler was a best-selling mystery novelist whose books seemed ideal for films. RKO Studios purchased the rights to Farewell My Lovely. However, the studio chose not to make a Philip Marlowe movie. Instead, they adapted it for a series about a character called the Falcon, starring George Sanders, a debonair, sophisticated man about town who was also an amateur detective. On its own terms, the film is a pleasant diversion, a B-film that looks better than it should with decent performances, including Ward Vaughn as Moose Malloy. Yet the Falcon is no Philip Marlowe. Is that the house? That's where I took him. You stay here and keep the engine running. And be prepared for a quick start. I don't even have to prepare. Better take this with you. Herman? For he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow. And so say all of us. Happy birthday, Herman. This ain't my birthday. How are you, Herman, anyway? And my name ain't Herman. <laughs> you can't fool me. You mean to say you're not Herman K. Ditton Frisch? Who is giving a party in this very establishment? 71 Washington Avenue. You got your numbers twisted, buddy. This is 17 Washington Avenue. You're in the wrong place, Herman. Come on. For he's a jolly good fellow. For he's a jolly good fellow. For he's a jolly good fellow. And so say all of us, and so say all of us, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, and so say all of us. Oh, no, no, I'm not trying to fight you. I didn't do nothing, Moose. Let's get out of here, quick. Let me see, he's gone. Maybe he forgot his hat. Wait here. I'm going in to investigate. I should have become a fireman like my old lady wanted me to. 20th Century Fox purchased The High Window, the third Philip Marlowe novel. But once again, Chandler's detective was not to be found. The movie adaptation Time to Kill became a vehicle for another B-film, this time for Detective Michael Shane, played by Lloyd Nolan. Clocking in at only 61 minutes, Time to Kill is a breezy, light-hearted murder mystery that fulfills its modest expectations. What's on your mind? When my husband died, he left me a valuable collection of old coins, the rarest of which was a brush of the blue. A what? A brush of the blue. Doesn't mean anything. Yeah. This is a brash of the bloom. Oh. It's an old American gold coin about the size of a $20 gold piece. Ordinarily, a copy is worth several thousand dollars, but mine happens to be particularly valuable because the designer, a man called Brasher, put his initials on the left wing of the eagle instead of the right. 
That's very interesting. What about it? A coin dealer called me up yesterday. Said he had a mate to mine. Wanted to sell it to me. That roused my suspicions. I've been through my collection. The doubloon was gone. No. Mm. It was stolen. But it didn't work out under its own power. Well, why didn't you call the police? Because it was stolen by one of my own family. Oh, how chummy. Who? My daughter-in-law. I have an idiot for a son. About a year ago, a nightclub entertainer, appropriately named Linda Conquest, married him for my money. They came to live here. Apparently, I didn't support them according to her expectations. She left last week without saying goodbye or letting us know where she could be reached. The reason is obvious. And you think she took it, huh? I don't think. I know. Well, what's worrying you most? Do you want to get the whatchamacallit back, or do you want to get your son unhooked? Both. I'm hiring you to get the doubloon back and to arrange a divorce without cost to me. Suppose she didn't take it. I expect you to prove that she did, and I'm asking no questions. Mm -hmm. Well, what are you going to charge me? Well, a dame like this, Lindy, you know, she probably won't settle for less than uh, 50000 And, you see, if I should keep her from making a fight like that on you, I think it's worth about 10%. $5,000? Yeah. You're crazy. I'm just smart. Well, I'll cut it in half. I don't want a chattel mortgage on you. Just a few days of your time. You drive an awfully hard bargain. Now, wait, I tell you what I'll do. Make it $1,000, 500 cash. Now, that's the lowest I can go. How do I know you're worth that much money? Well, you checked my references, didn't you? I tried to. No, make out a check to this young bandit for $500. The only one of your references I could contact was to Mr. Winfield Brown. And for your information, he is not a sanitary engineer. He is? No, he's a plumber. Why the rat, he lied to me. Lied to you. Say, if your son is around, I'd like to have... Yes, he knows nothing about this. I thought he might know where his wife is. He doesn't. He doesn't even know the doubloon has been stolen. Well, okay. You're dealing the cards. I can only play what you give me. Say, what's Linda look like? Have you got a picture of her? No. She's blonde, pretty, I suppose, in a coarse kind of way. Oh, well, that helps a lot. That narrows the field down to a quarter of a million. Oh, stop waving that thing at me. Mind you, keep your mouth shut about this. If Leslie gets to hear of it, I shall know who told him. There's your check. Thank you. Oh, uh, I almost forgot. What's the name of the coin dealer that phoned you? Washburn. Elisha Washburn, I believe. Elisha Washburn. Well, guess I can't make any more money around here. I'll see you, Carl. Go on, Toots. Toots. In 1944, Billy Wilder hired Raymond Chandler to write the screenplay for Double Indemnity. Chandler appeared in the film briefly in one scene with Fred McMurray. In 1944, Philip Marlowe finally arrived on the screen in Farewell My Lovely, although the title was changed to Murder My Sweet. Dick Powell, who played Marlowe, was most associated with romantic musical comedies. The title change was a clarification for the public's benefit. This was a murder mystery, not a musical comedy. In my estimation, Dick Powell was the best of all the Philip Marlowe's. You'd still be that. Isn't that so? I'm glad you hit me. It helps. Helps me a great deal. The black pool opened up at my feet again and I dived in. Next thing I remember, I was going somewhere. It was not my idea. The rest of it was a crazy, coked-up dream. I had never been there before. Where's the necklace?
window was open, but the smoke didn't move. It was a gray web woven by a thousand spiders. I wondered how they got them to work together. If Dick Powell was the best Philip Marlowe, the best Marlowe film appeared in 1946, The Big Sleep, starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, and directed by Howard Hawks. In The Simple Art of Murder, Raymond Chandler wrote, Down these mean streets the man must go who is not himself mean, who is neither tarnished nor afraid. The detective in this kind of story must be such a man. He must be a complete man and a common man, yet an unusual man. He must be, to use a rather weathered phrase, a man of honor. Marlowe of the Big Sleep personifies this code. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm looking for a good mystery on something off the beaten track like the Maltese Falcon. Oh, that was a fascinating story. But here's one that has everything the Falcon had and more. It's Raymond Chandler's latest bestseller, The Big Sleep. And what a picture that'll make. You mind if I look at it? Huh. Sometimes I wonder what strange fate brought me out of the storm to that house that stood alone in the shadows. As I probed into its mysteries, every clue told me a different story. But each had the same ending, murder. Every instinct warned me to beware that something more dangerous, more deadly than I'd ever known before was in that room. And suddenly, I like that. I'd like more. year 1947 saw the release by 20th Century Fox of the Brasher Doubloon starring a rather ineffectual George Montgomery as Philip Marlowe. His presence a lesser Philip Marlowe novel. While the plot is essentially a rehash of Time to Kill with Lloyd Nolan, the Brasher Doubloon is in the long run a far less enjoyable film. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Marlowe. Sit in that chair, please. And don't light that cigarette. I'm asthmatic. My doctor prescribes pork for my asthma. Since it's a medicine, I'm not offering you any. It's all right. Now, what's your trouble? Something's been taken from this house, and I want it back. Why don't you go to the police? Because I don't wish anyone arrested. You know who took it? Yes, I do, but I don't intend to tell you. Well, before we go any further, perhaps I'd better tell you that your son tried to get rid of me just now. Why? I'm not interested in discussing my son's motives with you, Mr. Marlowe. Well, have it your way. What's been taken? A coin. A rare gold coin called the Brasher Doubloon. A what? The Brasher Doubloon. It's a collector's item worth at least $10,000, probably more. It's a mint specimen. There are only two of them in the whole country. The Smithsonian Institute has the other. Where was it taken from? From that safe in there. May I see inside? Marlowe! Mm. Who besides yourself has the combination? Only my secretary, Miss Davis, and my son. Yes, Mrs. Murdoch. Open the safe for Mr. Marlowe. You're a coin collector, Mr. Murdoch? My late husband was. Marlowe, bring me the tray from which the Brasher doubloon was taken.
Hey, wait outside, please. What did the kid do? Twist your arm? Mrs. Murdoch will hear you. Why do you have to take that stuff from him? Mr. Marlowe, please. What's the matter, Murdoch? Can't you find it? She's got it. Shall I leave it here? Yes. And close the door on your way out. Just a minute, Merle. You better make out a check for Mr. Marlowe. What do you charge for your services? Uh, if I take the case, $25 a day and expense it. I see. And how much of a retainer do you expect? Uh, $100 will hold me. I should hope it would. All right, Merle. Make out a check for $100 payable to Mr. Philip Marlowe. And keep your mouth shut about it. Mrs. Murdoch, I think you know that I never talk about your affairs. Well, I just wouldn't. Not for the world, and I don't... Does this tell you anything? That's the only one that's missing? The only one. All the trays were checked in my presence after I discovered my loss. When was that? Day before yesterday. A man named Elisha Morningstar, coin dealer, telephoned and asked me if the Brasher de Bloom were for sale. I told him if he were a numismatist of any repute, he would know that it wasn't. I see. What did he say to that? And he asked if he might see the de Bloom, and when I told him no, he laughed and hung up. Naturally, that roused my curiosity. And I went to look at the coin. It wasn't there. Elijah Morningstar, eh? His office is in the Belfont building in downtown Los Angeles. <coughs> there you are, and I hope you're worth it. To tell you the truth, I expected an older man, someone more intelligent looking. I'm wearing a disguise. So you don't think your son's eagerness to get rid of me has any bearing on the case? Mr. Marlowe, as I've already told you, your job is merely to get the doubloon back. If you'll handle this matter for me, you'll handle it in my way. Sorry, that's not the way I work, Mr. Murdoch. If I have to do only what you want me to do, I can't take the case. Indeed, and how do you work? First of all, I insist that my clients tell me everything. And then I handle things my way. It's known far and wide as Marlowe's muddled method. Good day. The same year, 1947, MGM released The Lady in the Lake, starring Robert Montgomery as Philip Marlowe. In many ways, this is the weakest of all the Philip Marlowe movies. The director chose to do a subjective camera. The camera is Philip Marlowe. We see only what he sees, hear only what he hears. <laughs> Occupation, private detective. You know, somebody says, follow that guy. So I follow him. Somebody says, find that female. So I find her. But some cases, like this one, kind of creep up on you on their hands and knees. And the first thing you know, you're in it up to your neck. Right now, you're reading in your newspapers and hearing over your radios about a murder. They call it the case of the lady in the lake. It's a good title. It fits. What you've read and what you've heard is one thing. The real thing is something else. There's only one guy who knows that. I know it. This lady in the lake business started just three days before Christmas. Who invited you? I did. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Marlowe. Just when I was beginning to like you. Well, you want the facts, don't you? When it concerns a woman, does anybody ever really want the facts? Vain female, aren't you? Please don't be so difficult to get along with. I need help. What's going on here? He got cute. Striking an officer, resisting arrest and murder, all on Christmas Eve. Let's wrap you up real pretty, shall we? And take you right down to headquarters. Give me your hand. You'll see it just as I saw it. You'll meet the people, you'll find the clues. 
And maybe you'll solve it quick, and maybe you won't. You think you will, eh? Okay? You're smart. But let me give you a tip. You've got to watch them. You've got to watch them all the time. Because things happen when you least expect them. No, oh, don't! Don't! I love you, Rivera! <laughs> years elapsed before another Marlowe film appeared. This one, called simply Marlowe, was based on Chandler's The Little Sister and starred James Garner as the detective. Kevin Thomas of the Los Angeles Times called it ideal escapist entertainment. Other reviewers were not so kind. Critic Roger Ebert claimed the film was not very satisfactory. Gene Siskel called it a muddled disappointment. Mr. Marlowe? Uh, yes? Mr. Winslow Wong is freaking out. He's trying to make trouble for Mr. Philip Marlowe. What Wong doesn't know is that Marlowe's a tough guy to trouble. The word is you are a cool cat. Well, the word is wrong. I go all to pieces over nothing. James Garner is Marlowe, and Marlowe comes on strong. Car. Beep, beep. You're something else, Philip Marlowe. Now, you just start at the top. Uh, let it flow, you know what I mean? Don't try to sort it out. You want me to make a statement? That's the story, Marlowe. It's to be voluntary and without coercion? Your rules, huh? I won't lie to you, Lieutenant. All right, Marlowe. Not yet, Lieutenant. If I didn't have enough trouble, I gotta worry about you, too. Maybe. Suppressing information, concealing evidence. No. Yeah. Your license is dead as of now. Marlowe's the man who asks the question. Does your mother know what you do for a living? Marlowe's the man who's asked to give the answers. How'd you know about that, too? I'm a trained detective. Lousy private clothes. What can I buy you with? What's your price? How much? A hundred a day and expenses. Are you hard to occupy? But don't forget you're a lady. Do nice, fleshy, uncomplicated girls turn you on? Are you just a little gay, huh? What makes you so wonderful? I'm a trained detective. Welcome to Marlowe country. It's a nice place to visit, but you wouldn't want to live there. Nineteen seventy three saw the release of Robert Altman's version of The Long Goodbye. The script was written by Lee Brackett, who also collaborated on the script for the nineteen forty six The Big Sleep. For the long goodbye, she updated the series from the 1950s to the 1970s. In the review in Time magazine, Jay Cook said the film was a lazy, haphazard put-down, without affection or understanding. Other reviewers found the film far more noteworthy. Siskel and Ebert both gave it the thumbs up. Pauline Kael in The New Yorker praised Altman for achieving self-mocking fairy tale poetry. Marlowe, you're the nicest neighbor we ever have. Gotta be the nicest neighbor of a private eye. Meet Philip Marlowe. Marlowe? Marlowe! Marlowe! Your name, Marlowe? You shouldn't be out of bed, Mr. Marlowe. I'm not Mr. Marlowe. This is Mr. Marlowe right here. Well, who are you? You're Philip Marlowe. Are you crazy? Yeah. Elliot Gould is Philip Marlowe in Robert Altman's The Long Goodbye. <laughs> 
How come I horn you? You're supposed to get out of the way. It's okay, you're a nice dog. I didn't do nothing. This is Wade. Nina Van Pallette is Eileen Wade. She's a very shady lady. I like your face, too. I feel you're someone I can trust. Your crazy Looney Tune husband could have killed Sylvia Lennox. Sterling Hayden is her husband, Roger. Why don't you call your friend the Marlboro Man in here? It's not his business. He's a very crazy man. You ever think about suicide, Marlboro? Me? I don't believe in it. Laugh-In's Henry Gibson is Dr. V. Dr. V, Dr. V, Dr. V, you must help me, Dr. V. Do you know a Dr. V? Mm -mm. He's a shrink who's already been shrunk. Write the check, Roger. What check? Write the check, Roger. Whoa. Jim Bowden is Terry Lennox, a small-time punk. Well, that's you, Marlo. You'll never learn. You're a born loser. You can't take my money. I want my money. Mark Rydell is Marty Augustine, a big-time punk. It's supposed to be some kind of smart crack. What do you think, Mabel? Ow! Oh, wow. That's someone I love, and you I don't even like. The Long Goodbye has everything a detective movie should have. Well, could you explain that to me? Action. Sure. Suspense. Listen, Harry, in case you lose me in traffic, this is the address where I'm going. You Thank look you. great. Harry, I would straighten your tire a little bit. Yeah. Harry, I'm proud to have you following me. Mystery. What the hell are you doing here? That's right. I'm going to raise things swan. Swan. How are the I don't understand. I don't understand it at all. Beautiful girls, exotic locations. Hey, this is Wade. An exciting chase scene. <laughs> and a surprise ending. But this isn't it. Two years later, in 1975, Farewell My Lovely returned to the screen with Robert Mitchum as Marlowe. Charles Chaplin of the Los Angeles Times wrote the casting of Mitchum as Marlowe seemed exactly right. Critic Roger Ebert gave the film four out of four stars and said, Farewell My Lovely never steps wrong. Critic Gene Siskel wrote, Mitchum plays Marlowe with a delicious ease. He sounds just like Marlowe should sound. Mitchum, the last of the tough guys meets Rampling, the hottest of the new broads, in Raymond Chandler's sizzling murder classic, Farewell, My Lovely. Why don't you come over here and sit beside me? You know, I've been thinking about that for some time. Ever since you first crossed your legs, to be exact. These damn things are always up around your neck. Your name's Phil, isn't it? Philip, what's yours? Helen, kiss me. Philip Marlowe, the most famous private eye of them all, is up to his eyeballs in murder. And he's everybody's favorite target. Look, this is a gun. <laughs> when you got a gun in your hand, people are supposed to do what you tell them to do. What I need is another drink. I need a lot of life insurance. I need a home in the country. I need a vacation. I've got a hat, a coat, and a gun. That's it. Where to? My place. What for? You got everything we need with you. Let you and me go on up, huh? Okay, but leave off carrying me, will you? I can walk by myself. I'm all grown up now. I go to the Wait. bathroom by myself and everything. Get down. Do the 
sort of thing often? No, no, I'm usually pretty busy. At the monastery, praying with the other monks. Robert Mitchum, Charlotte Rampling, and Raymond Chandler's Farewell, My Lovely. Three years later, Robert Mitchum reprised his role as Marlowe in a remake of The Big Sleep. For some inexplicable reason, the writers, directors, and producers moved the action from L.A. to London, England. The film failed miserably. Janet Maslin of the New York Times said the film, with its all sarcasts, made an already confusing mystery even harder to follow. Kevin Thomas of the Los Angeles Times panned the film as a flat routine procedural detective mystery utterly devoid of any film noir atmosphere. This is Mr. Marlowe, General. Sir. You're looking at a rather dull survival of a gaudy life. A cripple both legs paralyzed, and just half his lower belly. Brandy? Thank you. I, I used to drink this with champagne. So you know Inspector Carson? Our paths cross now and then? No, he recommended you. He said you had that American quality of insubordination. Uh, what do you know of me? Well, you're very rich. Your wife died several years ago and you moved to England. You have two daughters, very pretty, but a trifle wild. The older one married an Irishman called Rusty Regan. I'm very fond of Rusty. Norris. He was a breath of life to me while he lasted. What happened to him? He went away. He went away a month ago. Without even saying goodbye to me, I'd hurt a little. I'll be hearing from him one of these days. Meanwhile, I'm being blackmailed again. Two or three months before Rusty came, about a year ago, I paid 5,000 pounds to a man by the name of Joe Brody to leave my younger daughter, Camilla, alone. I met her in the hall. Yes, I, I'm afraid my girls have all the usual vices. She tried to sit on my lap. I was standing up at the time. <laughs> uh, what, what about the uh, what about the note? Uh, On demand, I promise to pay Arthur Gwyn Geiger one thousand pounds. Signed, Camilla Sternwood. I'd pay. Why? Well, it's a little money against a lot of annoyance. I have pride, sir. This uh, bookseller Geiger. He says this is a gambling bet. Well, I'll pay this, how many more will turn up? Well, in that case, I'll come down on him. You'll think a bridge fell on him. I'm sure you will. Well, what are your charges, Mr. Marlowe? Fifty pounds per day, plus expenses, when I'm lucky. Well, that seems reasonable for removing morbid growths from people's backs. Matters in your hands. And don't ask my daughter Camilla about it. She'll just suck her thumb and look coy. And now, Mr. Marlowe, I must excuse myself. I'm, I'm tired. Twenty years passed before Philip Marlowe reappeared, this time as an adaptation of Poodle Springs. At the time of his death, Chandler had completed only four chapters. The book was finished by Robert Parker. This was an HBO film directed by Bob Rafelson and starring James Caan as Marlowe. $5,000. What's your problem, lady? I'd like to hire you to find my husband. When you're LA's number one private eye, risking your neck goes with the territory. I'm talking about very heavy people. They break legs more often than they break wind. You follow? That's why Marlowe's moving out to Poodle Springs. $100 a day plus expenses. You lost your purse. But he's about to learn. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't do purses. That trouble follows some guys wherever they go. This man is under arrest. Lock him up. Well, this is a mess, huh? Yeah, Bertie does that. 
That's not your problem anymore. Someone tried to set me up. That makes it my problem. Libby wants to talk to you. Let's go. In my business, when your client is murdered, it looks very bad if you just walk away. You don't have to go to the city to find bad guys. This is heavy business. I'm giving you a piece of it. In Poodle Springs, the hoodlums are on the move. Single shot through the skull, small caliber. And they're taking the town with them. What is it about Poodle Springs? It's just business, Philip. It's no different from a dozen other nice little towns out in the Except desert. Except it's the one closest to Nevada. So you're moving up. I'm moving the border across the state line where gambling isn't against the law. <laughs> There's no such thing as a clean dollar. Someone somewhere got screwed before it got to you. You see, Philip, all the parties have to get something they want. This is murder, Marlo. Got a suspect. I did, but she got shot. James Kahn is the godfather of private eyes. Philip Marlowe. Ask anyone. Moving home can be murder. Poodle Springs. Marlowe showed up again in 2022 in an adaptation of the 2014 novel The Black-Eyed Blonde by John Banville, writing under the pen name Benjamin Black. It was directed by Neil Jordan and starring Liam Neeson as Marlowe. The film received mixed reviews. Frank Schick from Hollywood Reporter wrote, Marlowe never comes to life on its own, lacking the verve or wit to make it feel anything other than a great pop song played by a mediocre cover band. Mick LaSalle, writing for San Francisco Chronicle, said, It's not a terrible movie, but a terribly misbegotten one, off in all its details. Los Angeles, a city of angels. More like the city of dirty little secrets. People pay me to look into the activities of its finest citizens. I'm a private detective. The name is Philip Marlowe. How private are your investigations, Mr. Marlowe? What can I do for you? I'd like you to find my lover. He disappeared without saying goodbye. Did he have things to hide? Haven't we all? What does my daughter want? My mother was in pictures. She must think there's something between us. I hear that you are looking for someone. We're all looking for someone. But I'll pay you a thousand if you find him for me. The puzzle has many pieces. I don't know what you're going to find. I'm going down the rabbit hole. I'm not afraid to take you with me. I do like this thing about not being afraid. Well, you should be. They're all in on the conspiracy. You'll keep looking because you can't stop. The police won't touch you, but I will. Of all the people in Los Angeles who you do not mess with, they're top of the list. The key to Hollywood is knowing when your game is up. You go in there, I'm coming out alive. I have to ask myself, who wins, Mr. Marlowe? I will do everything to put you in jail. All of our secrets, Mr. Marlowe. And your secrets? You'll have to keep those too.